Good morning. I am Sigrid Newell. Our first reading is from a book called The Genius of Birds by Jennifer Ackerman. One fairly reliable measure of intelligence in birds is the ability to do something new, to change your behavior to address new circumstances and new challenges. A prime example was the hooded crows that stole fish from ice fishermen by tugging on their lines with their beaks and walking across the ice as far as they could go, then returning for another stretch of line and stepping on it each time to make sure it didn't slip back. A recent, more high-tech instance of bird ingenuity popped up in 2018 when a scientist tracking Western gulls with geolocators to see where they fed was puzzled to see a gull traveling at 60 miles per hour for a distance of 75 miles crossing the Bay Bridge from San Francisco to Oakland and traveling along the interstates before returning by the same route to its nest. It turned out that the gull had hitched a ride on a garbage truck bound for an organic composting facility in the Central Valley near Modesto. At first, the researcher thought the gull might have been trapped in a truck, but then two days later, the same thing happened again. Clearly, this gull was using its head, if not its palate. As one Bay Area newspaper reporter quipped, it might be the only time a San Francisco resident ever drove to Modesto for dinner. But perhaps Sparrow's most, Sparrow's most famous feat is the one that defied a fancy human invention. Some years ago, a pair of biologists watched with surprise and delight as house sparrows in a New Zealand bus station repeatedly opened an automatic sliding door that led to the cafeteria. The birds flew slowly past the sensor or hovered in front of it or landed on top of it, leaning forward and bending their necks until their heads triggered the sensor. They did this 16 times in 45 minutes. The new automatic door had been installed only two months earlier, but the sparrows had easily conquered its workings. So the next time you're in a, some kind of a building that's got a sparrow in it, then check to see how the doors are going and see if there are any opening the doors. And next we have a spoken meditation. This is I Pray to the Birds by Terry Tempest Williams. I pray to the birds because I believe they will carry the messages of my heart upward. I pray to them because I believe in their existence. The way their songs begin and end each day, the invocations and benedictions of earth. I pray to the birds because they remind me of what I love rather than what I fear. Yeah. And at the end of my prayers, they teach me how to listen. As we go into a time of silent meditation, imagine yourself outdoors in a forest or in a meadow or even a city park. Breathe in deeply. Feel the presence of the natural world all around you.
And now we come to the sermon, The Amazing Intelligence of Birds. How do you define spirituality? More specifically, how do you define spirituality in a Unitarian Universalist context? For me, spirituality is a combination of awe and humility. Lately, I've been exploring the topic of intelligence of birds. This offers lots of opportunities, both for awe and humility. <clears throat> People love hummingbirds. They love their iridescence and high energy. This beauty occasions awe. Now, think about the size of the brain in that tiny head. It can't be any bigger than a single kidney bean. Yet, a hummingbird can go to a field full of flowers and recognize which flowers will already have nectar in them and which ones it has visited already and will be empty. But it also can tell time because it knows how long that flower takes to refill its nectar supply so that it can go back later. Could you do that? That's an occasion for humility. Scientists studying bird intelligence define it not as a high score on an IQ test, but rather as the ability to get, to acquire, process, store, and use information. To use that information for decision-making, finding patterns, planning, <clears throat> birds can do all of these. They also have abilities that we once considered uniquely human, manipulation, cheating, and kidnapping. But they also so show cooperation, collaboration, altruism, culture, and play. New high-tech methods of observing birds have helped scientists to discover hundreds of examples of intelligence in birds. How can a brain that's often no bigger than a kidney bean do such complex things? It turns out that compared to humans and other mammals, bird brains have more brain cells and higher neuron counts. Their neurons are much smaller more numerous and densely packed. The extra neurons are in the forebrain, the part of the brain that is associated with intelligence. As with humans, the part of the brain that allows for mapping and navigation is the hippocampus. Chickadees can remember hundreds of locations where they have stored seeds. In food caching birds such as chickadees, the hippocampus is twice as big as a sparrow's in relation to its total brain size. The hummingbird has a bigger hippocampus than any other bird relative to the whole brain size. Adaptations such as these, high neuron counts and a large hippocampus, allow birds an amazing intelligence. I have been exploring this topic with two books, the Bird Way, and The Genius of Birds. If you'd like more details about anything I say, I encourage you to go to these books. I could easily talk for several hours based on the information in these books. Today, I'll focus on two topics. First, the use of sounds, and second, tool use. While a real robin probably doesn't sing twiddly dee doodly dee, it does have more than 20 different songs. Scientists who study them can't even decipher the meaning of all of these songs. Around here, the robins are out and about again. 
Soon you'll be able to hear their most familiar song. Cheerio, cheerio, cheerio. Birds are exquisitely sensitive to variations in pitch, tone, and rhythm. They use these differences in song to recognize their own species and even to know individuals. Birds also have local dialects. Birds not only recognize their members of their own species, they also recognize if those members are from here or from far away. It's been observed that females respond more openly to males who sing the same dialect as they do. It's presumed that's because the males know the territory better and they'll have better nesting success. It turns out that dialects are learned from the parent bird and passed along like family heirlooms from generation to generation. Chickadees on Martha's Vineyard sing a different tune than those on the mainland. Cardinals listening to recordings respond more vigorously to local cardinal calls than to cardinals from somewhere else. Some dialects are only a few miles apart and birds living on the border between those two dialects are actually bilingual. Vocal learning is an essential aspect of intelligence that makes all of this possible. Fledgling songbirds in the nest hear their parents' song and try to copy them. In several different species, unborn birds can hear their parents' calls from inside the egg, and they can imitate those calls the minute they hatch. For bird songs to be meaningful, they have to have excellent hearing. For example, you have watched robins hunting for earthworms. They do it by listening. As they cock their heads patiently, they can hear the movement of an earthworm through the soil. Can you do that? Another opportunity for awe and humility. Some birds recognize individuals not only by song, but also by sight. A nifty experiment proved this. Researchers studying wild crows equipped a bunch of people with a kind of Halloween mask that covers the whole head. <clears throat> These people wandered around Seattle in an ordinary way on an ordinary day. But one person wearing a mask that looked like a caveman captured some of the wild crows and kept them in a cage for a few days. When the same group of people walked around Seattle a few weeks later, the crows mobbed the caveman character, screeching and pecking at him. These crows could apparently hold a grudge, and not only that, they could communicate that grudge to other crows. Nine years later, the same experiment was repeated with masked people walking around Seattle. Even after all that time, the crows remembered the face of the wrongdoer and mobbed it again. The mob included young that hadn't even been born at the time of the first experiment. Alarm calls are a second aspect of sound. If you are startled, you're likely to say, ah, or yikes, or more likely, some words that I shouldn't say on a Sunday morning in church. The alarm calls of birds are far more complex. It's the equivalent of saying, get over here and help me. There is a snake on the second branch of the tree there by the red wall. There are two basic kinds of calls, mobbing calls like the one I just did, recruit other birds to help attack a predator. You may have seen a bunch of crows flying frenetically around a hawk. The second alarm call says, flee, there's danger here, get away quickly. The chickadee dee dee call that we just heard is one of the most familiar of bird calls. These calls are a sophisticated form of communication. They can give other birds news of a tasty treat or warn of a predator. 
The number of the Ds indicate the predator type, size, and degree of threat. More Ds, chicka dee 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 dee, means a smaller, more dangerous predator. A bigger and more cumbersome predator, like an owl in a tree, doesn't get as many Ds. Such alarm calls communicate to fellow chickadees, and they also tell the predator that its cover is blown. It might as well not bother to attack these wary birds. Studies have shown that more than 70 species of animals have learned to eavesdrop on alarm calls such as those made by the chickadee and other birds. The alarm calls of birds alert animals such as squirrels and mice to take cover because there's a predator around. There are even three species of lizards that respond to bird alarm calls. A third way that sound is used is mimicry. Around here, mockingbirds are the most familiar mimics, but even local blue jays can imitate a hawk so effectively the bird watchers are, have been known to point their, bird, their binoculars up trying to find that hawk. Mimics do this to fool predators or repel rivals. Mimics also advertise themselves in order to get mates. In several species, females have been shown to prefer males who are the best mimics. The most awesome of these is a superb lyrebird. I encourage you to go to the web and use the search term bird mimics Attenborough and then click on superb lyre bird. You'll see these things in the chat. You will see a video made by David Attenborough of a lyre bird that mimics sounds that it has heard around it. The sound of a fire truck, woo, 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 woo. The click of a camera shutter, and the buzz of a chainsaw are all part of this bird's repertoire. The video is delightful. Birds often dance to impress females. This too is a part of mimicry. As we saw with Snowball the cockatoo, birds respond to sounds in their environment with a wide variety of moves, which can be individually choreographed. On the web, search on dancing birds to see a lot of other birds and their dances. Female birds, like human females, like males who are good dancers. It's no surprise that birds have excellent sight. For example, hawks fly high and can see tiny mice running in the grass far beneath them. Scientists study the connection between vision and cognition came up with an unusual discovery. Pigeons can discriminate between the painting styles of Matisse, Picasso, and Rembrandt. The researchers first taught the pigeons to recognize the difference by a food reward when the pigeons pecked at the designated picture. Then a week later, they showed the pigeons different paintings, but by the very same artists. The pigeons could tell the difference in these three styles. They pecked at the desired artist. Amazing, if amusing. Folk of my generation were taught <clears throat> that tool use is the thing that separates humans from the rest of the animal world. Then Jane Goodall proved that chimpanzees can use tools. The floodgates opened. Scientists found tool use in a wide variety of species. It's hard on the ego to let go of the notion that we humans hold primacy. Difficult as it is, there is pleasure in being open to new discoveries. As we heard earlier, within two months of opening, the sparrows learned to use an electronic door opener to let themselves into the cafeteria and grab a few crumbs from the, under the tables. In Japan, crows use cars as tools. They station themselves at crossing lights. When the light turns red, they fly down and position nuts 
on the road. Then they fly back up and wait while the green light lets the cars drive by. On the next red light, they fly down and pick up the cracked nuts to eat. If no car smashes a nut, the bird will reposition it. Gulls around the Mediterranean open hard-shelled clams and turtles by dropping them on bare rocks. It is said that the Greek poet Aeschylus was killed when a gull dropped a turtle on his bald head. Crows living on the island of New Caledonia in the Pacific are the champion tool users. They craft the leaves of the pandanus tree into a great variety of complex tools. These crows are the only species other than humans that use a hook, make and use tools that are hooks. New Caledonian crows bend sticks to extract grubs from nooks and crannies of plants. It takes a lot of complicated steps to make the tools that they use. The crows make several methodical cuts and tears in the leaf before removing the fully crafted tool from the branch. This suggests that they have an image of the tool in their heads before they start making it. Once the tool has extracted the grub, the crows must take the tool out of their beaks in order to eat the grub. They very carefully put the tool down beneath a claw to hold it while they are eating. Scientific observers note that the crows clearly know the difference between high value tools that they spent a lot of time working to make and low value tools. They're just sticks that they picked up off the jungle floor. Crows keep the high value tools with them and fly from place to place so they have them to use the next time they're working on grubs and they drop the low value tools. Our local birds may not be so dramatic, but they also make and use tools. Not hatches use bark flakes in hold bark flakes in their bills to use as levers to pry off bits of bark so they can get to the grubs beneath. Chickadees have been seen using thorns to get seeds out of suet cakes. Great blue herons collect breadcrumbs, popcorn, other small bits left by picnickers, and then they drop them on the surface of the water. The minnows all come to this great feast and the herons have a feast. I've been telling you fascinating stories about evidence of intelligence in birds. However, intelligence is not an unalloyed virtue. Bolder, more adventuresome birds can be exposed to more risks. They might encounter new parasites, new predators, new poisons. Stay at home birds may be safer. Scientists record that in every population, there are some birds that are more cautious. Birds have individual differences in their personalities. Genes for cautious, stupid birds remain in a population because they too have their advantages over the long haul. They can survive when sometimes the risk-taking birds don't. While being awed by the astonishing plasticity of bird behavior, we can also be humbled by knowing that all levels of intelligence have their place in the grand scheme of things. What are we to make of all this? It appears that there are three ways of being intelligent. Our mammal way, the plant way, and the bird way. Three ways to make an intelligent mind. If we can be open, it is exciting to envision a world that we never really knew was out there. Look at those small birds hopping around a bird feeder. Think of all the tiny brains that are communicating, using tools, playing, parenting, and thinking. We must be humble. We human beings are not the center of our planet. Can you let these ideas change your perception of the world you live in? 
Can you embrace them to feel both awe and humility? To recognize that we share our planet with other conscious thinking beings requires a sacrifice of ego. This too is an aspect of spirituality. It opens us up to be delighted by the grand fabric of our planet. As Darwin wrote, there is grandeur in this view of life. An important way we celebrate life each Sunday is by offering an opportunity to practice generosity. Members and friends support our congregation with an annual pledge throughout the year. Another way to support the good work of this congregation is by making a generous contribution by way of one of the options shown on the next slide. You can click on the tiny URL link in the chat window to contribute or you can send a text to the number shown on the screen. The examples on the slide show how to label your text to indicate the amount and the purpose or the intent of your gift. We must now say goodbye to our Facebook friends. Please consider joining us on Zoom the next time. You can find more information at albanyuu.org. That's albanyuu.org. Dot o -R -G. Our offertory music today is Birds of Rhiannon. The composer and the musician is Alyssa Yeager. It's me. Thank you, Alyssa, for that beautiful song. We enjoy welcoming guests and visitors to our service. If you'd like to tell us who you are and where you're from, you can click on the raise hand symbol. Depending on your Zoom version, you will find the raise hand option either in the participant window or in the reactions button on your Zoom toolbar. Our technician will invite you to unmute and introduce yourself. You may also, or instead, click on the visitor link you'll find now in the chat window. Do we have any visitors today? We start with Deborah Barnes. Deborah, unmute and uh, share. Hello, I'm a friend of Sigrun's. I'm from Altamont. Welcome. Could you hear me? Oh yeah. Okay. I don't see any others at the moment. Okay. Thank you and welcome to all who have joined us today. If you'd like to learn more about our congregation or about Unitarian Universalism, you can find in the participant window someone with welcome before their name. You can reach out to that person privately in the chat window now or after the service. We welcome the chance to greet each other. And in our Zoom format, this is done through virtual breakout rooms. You can say hello and share your name. This will last about two minutes and then we'll all come back together again.
that are left unspoken, let us hold all that we have heard and felt in our hearts. Here we have another song that you can sing along with. The Happy Wanderer, Alyssa Yeager, will be presenting it. The uh, composers are Antonio Ridge and Frederick Muller. As we extinguish the chalice, please join us in the words that are on the screen. We extinguish the flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. I pray to the birds because I believe they will carry the messages of my heart upward. I pray to them because I believe in their existence. The way their songs begin and end each day, the invocations and benedictions of earth. I pray to the birds because they remind me of what I love rather than what I fear. And at the end of my prayers, they teach me how to listen. Today, we thanks, thank our musician, Alyssa Yeager. Our ushers on Zoom are Chuck Manning, Dawn Dana, and Jean Popeye. Our pastoral care associates, Annie Levitsky and Randy Rosette. The service associate is me, Al DeSalvo. Our welcomer is Peter Brown. Office support from Tammy Goddard Hathaway and Patience Pichette. Our technical support, Chris Jensen and Kate Pierce. And our flowers today are donated and arranged by Chuck and Barbara Manning in memory of Barbara's mother, Dorothy Crossett. If anyone wishes to make a live announcement at this time, please click on the raise hand symbol in your Zoom toolbar. The technician will cue you and unmute yourself and present your announcement. <laughs> <laughs> 